Hello, good day, and welcome to the discussion on the responses to altered respiratory function. Please take note that this recorded lecture is intended for the level 3 students of the Bachelor of Science in Nursing. This lecture does not constitute medical advice and parts of the discussion may not be suitable for the general public. This is only a supplementary material and is being augmented by live or synchronous sessions to reinforce understanding of the concepts. The photograph and videos used in this presentation belong to the respective owners, authors, and website. No copyright infringement is intended. Concerns regarding this presentation may be sent to jjsporque at cpu.edu.ph. Now we'll be talking about respiratory function. This is an image of a typical patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. As we go along towards this discussion, we hope to understand on how to care for this patient. Prior to going to the discussion on the specific diseases, we will be reviewing the anatomy of the respiratory tract and then the assessment findings pertinent to this system. We know that this system is important for us to maintain adequate oxygenation and tissue perfusion. Remember, the source of the oxygen that our body cells need is from the air that we breathe. Okay, so your respiratory tract is divided into two. We have your upper airways and then your lower airways. For the upper airways, we have the following organs. So you have your nose, okay, your sinuses, going towards your pharynx, which is divided into three sections. You have your nasopharynx, your oropharynx, and then your laryngopharynx. You have your tonsils and adenoids. You also have your larynx, which is your voice box, and then you have your trachea, which is your windpipe. For the lower airways, you have your, okay, you have your bronchus, you have the bronchioles, you have the alveoli, of course, you have the entire lungs, and then you also have the pleura, okay, where, which acts as a viscous fluid that decreases the friction of the lungs towards the other organs of the mediastinum whenever it is expanding. Let's go to the upper respiratory tract. The first organ is your nose. So your nose is known to filter impurities. It also humidifies and warms the inhaled air. So this is done by the presence of your cilia. This also reminds us that our nose is highly vascular. For that reason, our nose is prone to nose bleeding or what you refer to as epistaxis because there is a lot of blood vessels that warm the air that by the time that the air would enter. So the external opening of our nose is referred to as nares, and our nose is divided by your septum. Take note that septum is a cartilage. Each nasal cavity is divided into three passageway by the projection of your turbinates. So you have your superior, you have your middle, and then you have your inferior turbinates. These bones increases the mucous membrane surface of the nasal passages and slightly obstruct the air flowing through them. The paranasal sinuses are four pairs of bony cavities that drain into the nasal cavity. Their prominent function is to act as the resonating chamber in speech. Common problem that we encounter for this part is infection that we refer to as sinusitis. Then you have your pharynx, tonsils, and adenoids. The pharynx act as a passageway. Okay, it is divided into three parts. You have your nasopharynx, you have your oropharynx, and then your laryngopharynx. So it is a tube-like structure that connects the nasal and oral cavities towards your larynx. It is a passageway for both our respiratory tract and digestive tract. Then we have your tonsils and adenoids. The tonsils and adenoids perform functions that are relevant to the immune system. In other words, this structure links the chain of lymph nodes guarding the body from invasion by organisms entering the nose and the throat. Also have your larynx. The larynx is the voice box with the function of vocalization. It also protects the lower airway from foreign substances. It facilitates coughing. That's why for this reason, it is considered to be the watchdog of the lungs. Considered as that watchdog because if there are any foreign bodies that attempts to enter the airway, your larynx will act on it okay, by facilitating coughing. Now it has these parts. One is epiglottis. The function of your epiglottis is that it serves as a flap of cartilage that covers the opening of the larynx during swallowing. So every time we will swallow such that the food will go directly to the digestive tract and not to the esophagus, the larynx or the epiglottis specifically will close the airway. 
Then we have your glottis. The glottis is the opening between the vocal cords and the larynx. Okay, it's the opening of the vocal cords in the larynx. Then we have your thyroid cartilage, which is the largest cartilage structure. Okay, part of it would form what we commonly know as your Adam's apple. Then you have your cricoid cartilage. This is the only complete cartilaginous ring in the larynx. It is located between the thyroid cartilage or just below the thyroid cartilage. Then you have the vocal cords, which are ligaments that are controlled by muscular movements that produce a sound, okay, which is located in the lumen of your larynx. For that reason, your larynx is referred to as the voice box okay, because it is where your vocal cords are located. Then we have your trachea or windpipe. The trachea is a smooth muscle. It is composed of C-shaped rings of cartilage at regular intervals. So here, your trachea can be seen okay, going downwards. It acts as the passage between the larynx and the right and the left main stem bronchi. Okay, so this is your uh, right bronchi going towards your left bronchi. Okay, it enters the lungs through the space or uh, anatomical location referred to as hilus. So it enters the lungs through your hilus. Now we have your lower respiratory tract. For the lower respiratory tract, of course, we have your lungs. The lungs is a sponge-like, elastic, cone-shaped organ. Okay, it's elastic. It, it can expand. Okay, it is an airtight chamber. Although your lungs, you might say that your lungs entertain air, because it is where air exchange would take place, your lungs is an airtight chamber, meaning if there is presence of air abnormally in other part of the lungs or outside the lungs, that might result to lung collapse. Collapse because your lung is considered to be an airtight chamber. Then it is it has your distensible walls. Now the differentiation between your right lung and your left lung. Your right lung is composed of three lobes. On the other hand, your left lung is considered to be narrower and smaller. It only contains two lobes. So again, the right lung contains three lobes, whereas the left lung contains two lobes. Now you have your pleura. The purpose of the pleura, so the pleura is the cavity that surrounds your lungs. So this cavity is referred to as pleura. The purpose of your pleura is to provide lubrication in such a way that it lubricates the thorax and the lungs to permit smooth motion of the lungs within the thoracic cavity during expansion or during inspiration and expiration. Okay, so your pleura is composed of two parts. So you have your visceral pleura and your parietal pleura. Just think that your visceral pleura is very close to the lungs. Okay, visceral, very close to the lungs. So that's why the first part of the pleura that you will see close to the lungs is your visceral pleura. Okay, this is your visceral pleura. Then followed by the fluid contained inside the pleural cavity and then followed by your parietal pleura. So it is the parietal pleura that lines the thoracic cavity, the lateral wall of the mediastinum, the diaphragm, and the inner aspect of the ribs. Whereas the visceral pleura directly covers your lungs. So again, your pleura is divided into two. You have your visceral and parietal. The one closest to your lung is your visceral pleura. Then, this is an x-ray image showing the chest. Later on, we will know that x-ray is among the diagnostic tests that can be used to evaluate for the cardiac functioning. Okay, for the, Not only for the cardiac, but also for pulmonary functioning. So if we talk about the trachea, you can see the trachea here. Okay, Then, we can see the branches already of your bronchus. Okay, so you can say here the right main bronchus is pointed towards here. You also have your left main bronchus here. Okay. Oftentimes, the junior or uh, learners of healthcare would think that this is a consolidation secondary to pneumonia. But no, this is a normal x-ray which shows the bronchus and the bronchi. Okay. These are branches of your bronchus. Now, this is another x-ray which shows other anatomical landmarks. The anatomical landmarks here shown here are specific to cardio. Now, this is also another x-ray which shows the images okay, and the labels. Okay, so you have the labels on the aortic arc. Okay, this is your superior vena cava. Then you have your thoracic vertebra. Okay, so take note of how a normal x-ray would look like. Then this x-ray shows an x-ray of a patient with COVID-19 in comparison 
okay, to somebody with normal x-ray. So the x-ray on the right shows the consolidates and the infiltrates brought about by your COVID-19. Okay, as you would compare to a normal x-ray, usually you will not see haziness here or whitish discoloration. Okay, so this indicates already as a sign of your COVID-19, okay, which is also a pneumonia first. This slide shows the branches of the main bronchi. So if you can see the bronchus, okay, or from the trachea, it would branch out to the two main bronchus, which is your right bronchus and then your left bronchus. Remember that there are three lobar bronchi on the right side. So once the main bronchus would branch out, such as your right bronchus, if it would branch out, there will be three lobar bronchi. The branches of your bronchus is referred to as lobar bronchi, as in referring to the lobes of the lungs. So the three main branches for the right side are right superior, right middle, and then right inferior, lobar bronchus. On the other hand, for the left, since there is only two lobes for the left side of the lungs, the branches are left superior lobar bronchus and then left inferior lobar bronchus. This slide shows the segmental bronchi. So from the main bronchial branch, it would go towards the lobar bronchi, thereafter your segmental bronchi. So this shows the 10 segmental bronchi on the right and the eight segmental bronchi on the left. These are the bronchi, okay, or the segmental bronchi that facilitate effective postural drainage in our patients. This is the reason why in your fundamentals of nursing, you are thought that you need to reposition the patient whenever you need to have postural drainage. Okay, that is to drain the different segmental bronchi. So each of the colors here correspond to one segmental bronchi. Now, these are the 10 segmental bronchi on the right and the 8 segmental bronchi on the left. So you can notice that the labels are apical, posterior, anterior. You also have lateral, medial, superior, anterior, basal, lateral, medial, posterior, basal. And then for the left, you have the apico, posterior, anterior, superior, lingular. You also have your inferior, lingular, superior, anterior, medial, basal, lateral, basal, and posterior, basal. Okay. Although there is no need to memorize this, you need to familiarize with their location. This would remind us that whenever we need to drain the secretions of our patient, we need to reposition our patient to facilitate wherever the secretions are located. After the segmental bronchi, you would have your bronchioles. So recall again, you have the lobar bronchi going towards the segmental bronchi, going towards the subsegmental bronchi, and then the smaller ones are your bronchioles. Okay? After your bronchioles, you have the term terminal bronchioles. So when I say terminal, they are on the peripheral aspect of your bronchioles. They are considered to be transitional passageway between the conducting airways and the gas exchange airways. A relevant concept under your terminal bronchioles is what we refer to as your physiologic dead space. So when I say physiologic dead space, this is about 150 ml of air in the tracheobronchial tree that does not participate in gas exchange. Okay, So this air is present in our body, however, it does not participate in gas exchange. So we can notice that there is physiologic dead space. Okay, It is referred to as physiologic dead space, meaning there is an alveoli here, however, no gas exchange would take place. Another term is anatomic dead space. So this is your anatomic dead space, meaning these are air. Okay, this is, contains air which does not, which do not participate in your gas exchange. Okay, they are just on the branches of the trees of the bronchioles, but they do not participate in gas exchange. So this concept later on is important on setting up the patient on mechanical ventilator. So we refer to that one as your dead space. So we have the physiologic dead space and then the anatomic dead space. Alveoli. If the kidney has the basic unit, which is referred to as nephron, the basic unit of the lungs is referred to as alveoli. Our body has 300 million alveoli, which constitute about a total surface area of 50 to 100 square meters. There are three kinds of alveolar cells. First is type 1. The type 1 acts as a barrier between the air and the alveolar surface. The type 2, which is composed of about 5% of the cells, is responsible for producing the type 1 cells and the surfactant. 
And the third type of cell is your alveolar macrophages. As the term implies, macrophages, these are in charge of our immune system. So these are phagocytic cells, meaning they try to engulf foreign bodies that would go towards our alveoli. Now, I've mentioned surfactant. Take note that surfactant is produced by type 2 cells. So when I say surfactant, surfactant are chemicals which reduces the surface tension of the alveoli. Okay? Reduction of the surface tension is vital to ensure expansion of the alveoli. Oftentimes, your surfactant is given among patients who were delivered preterm because preterm babies lack surfactant. Since they lack surfactant, their lungs will not be able to expand, air exchange will not be able to take place. So, to decrease the surface tension in the alveoli, surfactant is needed. So, what are the functions of the respiratory system? There are several. So, you have your oxygen transport and carbon dioxide removal. You also have respiration, ventilation, and then gas exchange. Oxygen transport and carbon dioxide removal. So, our respiratory system would transport oxygen to our body through the arteries and then would have carbon dioxide removed from the veins. Now, this is done through the thin walls of your capillaries. So the exchange takes place between the capillaries and the alveoli. Now, respiration. Respiration is the gas exchange between the atmospheric air and the blood and between the blood and the cells of the body. Again, respiration is the gas exchange between the atmospheric air and the blood and then between the blood and the cells of the body. The next function of the respiratory system is ventilation. This involves the process of inspiration and expiration. So in the process of ventilation, the primary action is the movement of the walls of the thoracic cage and the diaphragm. Now, when the capacity of the chest is increased, which is done by the contraction of your diaphragm, okay, when the diaphragm would contract, it flattens out to increase the vertical diameter of the thoracic cavity. So whenever there is increase of capacity, inspiration takes place, meaning the air goes in from the atmosphere towards your lungs. Hence, inspiration would take place. It would move towards the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the alveoli, and later on, it would inflate the lungs. And then after that, the chest wall and diaphragm would return to its previous position for expiration to take place. The lung would recoil, so when I say recoil, it's deflating, and force the air out through the bronchi and the trachea. So again, whenever there is an increase in the capacity, inspiration takes place. Inspiration consumes about one-third of the time of the full respiratory cycle. On the other hand, okay, your expiration uh, consumes the latter two-thirds of the time. When I say inspiration, it commonly involves the use of energy. That's why it's referred to as an active process. Whereas, whereas expiratory phase is normally passive. It requires little energy. Then gas exchange. In gas exchange, okay, it is the delivery of the oxygen from the lungs to the bloodstream and then the delivery of carbon dioxide from the bloodstream to the lungs. Okay, this occurs in lungs between the alveoli and the capillaries, which are located also in the walls of the alveoli. Now, there are several mechanics involved in ventilation. If you can recall earlier, when I say ventilation, it involves the process of inspiration and expiration brought about by the size or the increasing in the capacity of the thoracic cavity and the diaphragm. So the first mechanics of ventilation is air pressure variance. This means that okay, the movement is brought about by the difference on the air pressure. The movement of the air is from the area of higher pressure to a region of lower pressure. The next mechanics of ventilation is airway resistance. So airway resistance is determined by the radius or size of the airway, the lung volume, and the airway velocity. Now, any process that would alter the bronchial diameter would affect airway resistance and later on alter the rate of airflow for a given pressure gradient during respiration. What we are expecting is that if there is increased resistance, 
there will be greater effort that is needed to achieve normal levels of ventilation. Meaning, if there is narrowing of the airways, if there is increased resistance, the respiratory system along with the other muscles in the respiratory system would need to exert additional effort in order for it to ensure adequate ventilation. Now, here are some of the conditions that leads to increased airway resistance. Asthma. Asthma causes constriction of your bronchial smooth muscles. Your, your chronic bronchitis, on the other hand, causes thickening of the bronchial mucosa. Obstruction of the airway is caused by the mucus, tumor, and foreign body. And then emphysema leads to lo loss of lung elasticity. So this is characterized by a connective tissue encircling the airways, thereby keeping them open during inspiration and expiration. So your problem in emphysema is the loss of lung elasticity. The next mechanic is lung compliance. So lung compliance is defined as the elasticity and expandability of the lungs. So whenever there is an increase in lung compliance, it means that there is loss of elastic recoil. When I say recoil, recall that this is rebound of the lungs, okay, meaning this is the decrease of the size of the lungs in response to inhalation. Recoil is equal to exhalation. Whenever there is increase in lung compliance, the capability of the lungs to recoil is lost. That would lead to over distension, such as emphysema. So in emphysema, there is air trapping because the lungs is not able to recoil. Next, if there is decreased lung compliance, the lungs and the thorax appear to be stiff, meaning it could not allow a lot of air to, go, to get inside. It could not allow adequate air to get inside the lungs. These are present in conditions such as morbid obesity due to the space occupied by the adipose tissues. You also have pneumothorax or the presence of air in the thoracic cavity, hemothorax, which is blood in the thoracic cavity, pleural effusion, which is excess of the fluid in the pleural space, pulmonary edema, which is water in the pulmonary cavity, atelectasis, the collapse of the lungs, and then pulmonary fibrosis, which is the stiffening of the interstitial lung tissues and acute respiratory distress syndrome. So whenever any of this condition would occur, there is decrease in lung compliance, meaning the lung and the thorax are stiff. It would not allow for adequate air to get inside. Okay? When this happens, greater than normal energy expenditure is needed again by the patient to achieve normal levels of ventilation. So for ventilation again to take place successfully, there needs to be a balance between air pressure, airway resistance, and lung compliance. Increase or decrease in any of these three could result to abnormality in ventilation. Other functions of the respiratory system would include acid-base balance. Recall that carbon dioxide is primarily excreted through the lungs. So whenever there is acidosis for the body to compensate, the lungs will excrete carbon dioxide. Whereas if there is no adequate ventilation, carbon dioxide stays in the body, results also to acidosis. Whenever there is hyperventilation, the tendency of the body is to excrete carbon dioxide in such a way that it can lead to alkalosis. Speech. Recall earlier our discussion on the vocal cords, okay? Then the sense of smell. The, smells, the sense of smell is, of course, taken care of by our nose. And, of course, cranial nerve number one, which is your olfactory nerve. So from your nose, it would go towards your olfactory nerve. That's why any problem on the upper respiratory system could also affect the sense of smell and even the sense of taste of our patient. Fluid balance. Recall that there are insensible fluid losses through the lungs, okay, which could amount from 300 ml to 500 ml of fluids. And then temperature control. Your lungs is capable of heat dissipation, meaning if there is heat or excess heat inside the body, your lungs would be able to compensate by breathing faster for the heat to be excreted and for the air to cool the body. Now, let's talk about respiratory volume and capacity. There are several terms here that, we'll, that you might have heard for the first time, including tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, residual volume, and vital capacity. So all of these volumes and capacity are affected by gender, age, weight, and health status. Generally, as the patient ages, the volume and the capacity of the lungs also decreases. 
let us start with tidal volume. Tidal volume or TV is defined as the amount of air move in and out of the lungs with each normal quiet breath. Okay, so in normal breathing, the amount of air that goes in and out of our lungs is referred to as tidal volume. The approximate amount of that is 500 mm. Again, right now, normally, when you are inhaling, exhaling, we are expecting that 500 ml of air went in, 500 ml of air went out. Okay, in normal inspiration and expiration. The next term is inspiratory reserve volume. Inspiratory reserve volume is the amount of air that can be inhaled forcibly over tidal volume. So meaning, if we can inhale 500 ml regularly, normally, okay, inhale, I can still add additional of 2,100 to 3,100, okay, beyond my tidal volume. So meaning I can still allow my lungs to expand up to 2,100 or even 3,100 ml after my regular inhalation. We refer to this one as your inspiratory reserve volume. That's why it's referred to as reserve, meaning if your body needs to inhale more air, it is capable of doing so. So again, 2,100 to 3,100. The next term is expiratory reserve volume. It is the amount of air that can be forced out over the tidal volume. So earlier, if that was an excess, quote unquote, okay, excess inhalation for inspiratory reserve volume, your expiratory reserve volume, quote unquote, is like an excess in your exhalation. So meaning after your regular exhalation, you can still add another 1000 ml of air that could be exhaled. Okay, we refer to that one as your expiratory reserve volume or your ERV. On the other hand, the next term is residual volume. As the term implies, residual, meaning this is the volume that remains after a forced expiration or expiration. Okay, so once you have exhaled everything, still there is a little amount of air that remains and that is 1,100 ml of air. Okay, then we have the term, the total of your tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume plus your expiratory reserve volume is what we refer to as your vital capacity. Okay, vital capacity, meaning this is the total amount of air that could be inhaled by our lungs and also the total amount of air that could be exhaled by our lungs. We refer to that one as your vital capacity. Now, let's take note of the gerontologic considerations for our patient. Many changes in the older adults result from heredity and a lifetime exposure to environmental stimuli. Because remember that exposure to environmental stimuli is considered to be cumulative in effect. So examples of this is your cigarette smoking, bacteria, pollutants, industrial fumes, and irritants. So the effect of these substances is said to be cumulative. Okay? Meaning as long as, as the longer you have been exposed to these substances, the higher the risk that you will have the diseases associated to this. Then you will have age-related changes, okay, that would include your muscles, your cardiac system, and then your vascular system. So take note for the muscles, there might be a tendency for the muscles of our old adult patients to dystrophy, okay? So when I say dystrophy, it means the decrease in the size of the muscles because of lack of usage. Okay, they might have problems on the use of their diaphragmatic muscles and respiratory muscles. For the cardiac functioning, if they have heart failure or if they have been on prolonged hypertension, they might have conditions such as heart failure, which makes it difficult for them to cope if ever they have an episode of hypoxemia. Unlike in young adults, if ever they have an episode of hypoxemia, their heart will be able to compensate by increasing its heart rate. Whereas for the old adult, their heart rate might be able to increase, however, the effect is not lasting long. Okay, for the vascular system, there are also blood vessel changes that also hinders the distribution of oxygen towards your vital organs. Now, for the assessment still, we ask for the age, the sex, and the race, okay, because this can affect the physical and diagnostic findings related to breathing. Then, we talk about occupational lung diseases. So when I say occupational lung diseases, these are because of the occupation or work where they are exposed. Okay, so there are several examples for this. One is your asbestosis. So when I say asbestosis, that is because of asbestos. 
because of silicon so we have your silicosis and then you also have your cwp or your coal workers pneumoconiosis so the general term for occupational lung diseases is pneumoconiosis okay pneumoconiosis so these are diseases which are commonly acquired in the workplace so the management usually for this kind of patients is only more of supportive and then we give oxygen therapy for them and then we really advocate for them to be removed from the source of these substances. So they might need to change their job or they need to ensure that they are using the adequate PPE during their work time. Okay, then we also check for history of toxic lung injury and then hypersensitivity disease or disorder. So for hypersensitivity, that could be because of fumes, chemicals, it could be animals, birds, other pollutants. So you need to know on what substances your patient are allergic on. Okay, so this one is an x-ray which shows pneumoconiosis. So you can see on the upper part of the x-ray on your left that there is a accumulation of mass. Okay, these are actually the substances which they have collected from their workplace. So it gets clogged up on the bronchioles, it gets clogged up on the alveoli, hence impairing the functioning. Okay, this one is an example of a coal worker's pneumoconiosis. Okay, as you can see, the coal is being stored or being clogged in your alveoli okay, and your bronchioles per se. Okay? Then this one is asbestosis. Asbestosis, so uh, as you can see, there are deposits of asbestos. Okay? Deposits of asbestos. So the recommendation for this patient is that they would have mask and then adequate ventilation to protect the respiratory system from inhalation of these irritants okay, or substances. Next, family history. In the family history, we need to assess for the presence of asthma because asthma has a familial predisposition. Also, cystic fibrosis. Okay, If you're familiar with the cystic fibrosis on the movie Six Feet Apart, Okay, so in cystic fibrosis, it is a hereditary disease which affects the lungs and digestive system. Your problem here when it comes to the lungs is that the production of the thick and sticky mucus. So this thick and sticky mucus can clog the lungs and obstruct the pancreas. Okay, they can clog the lungs and obstruct the pancreas. Hence, your problem will be leading towards ineffective airway clearance. You also have your lung cancer. Then you have your A1 Okay, antitrypsin deficiency. So when I say A1 antitrypsin deficiency, your A1 antitrypsin is actually a neutrophil elastase inhibitor, meaning it is an antiprotease. Okay, again, it is a neutrophil elastase inhibitor, which acts as an antiprotease. So what if it is an antiprotease? It protects the lungs from the protease-mediated tissue destruction. Okay, so again, in your lungs, what can possibly occur is your protease-mediated tissue destruction. Okay, this protease-mediated destruction is supposedly a protective mechanism, but in excess, it can ruin your lung. Okay, so that's why there needs to be an A1 antitrypsin. However, hereditarily, okay, or heredi genetically, there are patients who have deficiency of A1 antitrypsin. And because of this, your protease could not be stopped, leading towards your lung destruction. And then you have your infectious diseases. Okay, so for your infectious diseases, you have, for example, your tuberculosis. Okay, you ask for family history because if somebody in the family could have tuberculosis, there is a high tendency that other family members will also be affected. Next, respiratory history. So you ask for the smoking history of the patient. One thing that you can do okay, is to ask for the use of cigarette, cigar, pipe tobacco, marijuana, and other controlled substances. You ask your patient or you try to determine what is pack years. Okay, so when I say pack years, number of packs per day times number of years smoking. So let's say, for example, the patient will say he is smoking two packs of cigarettes per day. If he had been smoking for 20 years, that would mean two packs times 20, that would mean 40 packs years. So your pack years is used as an indication of the concentration or cumulative effect of the cigar and its substances in your lungs. So the higher the pack years, the higher the likelihood that the patient's lungs is already damaged. Now, drug use. 
for the drug use, both prescribed drugs and illicit drugs should be asked. Next, food allergies. So for the food allergies, you need to ask your patient if he or she is allergic to foods, dust, molds, pollen, bee stings, trees, grass, animal dander, saliva, or any other drugs. Okay, because your food allergy could manifest within these signs and symptoms. It could be as simple as rhinitis, could have chest tightness, weakness. Oftentimes, patients will say difficulty of breathing. Then you will have orticaria or itchiness. There could be severe wheezing. And for severe wheezing, we need to continuously assess our patient because by the time that the wheezing is gone, we would suspect complete airway obstruction already. Okay, then loss of consciousness. Because remember, even though some will say that this is just an allergy, your allergy could result to anaphylaxis. And anaphylaxis is a life-threatening condition. Then you, have, you need to check for current health problems, okay? Such as cough. Cough is usually a sign, common sign of lung disease. Most, if not all, of the lung diseases would manifest with cough. Especially right now, because this is the season of COVID, if you have patients who have respiratory signs and symptoms, such as your cough, you need to ensure that your patient is screened properly for the novel coronavirus. Then you check if the sputum is productive or non-productive, if, if the cough is congested, dry, tickling, or hacking. Now, for the sputum production. Yellow or green sputum would indicate that your patient is having an infection, particularly a bacterial one. Okay, you also need to check for consistency if it is thin, thick, watery, or frothy. If it is a thick sputum, you might need to instruct your patient to increase oral fluid intake to facilitate the liquefaction of your sputum. You might need to administer medications such as your N-acetylcysteine or your flumosil to soften the secretions. Okay, you might also need to administer your pulmo aid inhalation or your nebulization to aid the patient. Then it may also be watery or frothy. So for the frothy sputum, it is usually indicative of pulmonary edema. Chronic bronchitis is an example of a disorder wherein there is mucoid sputum. Okay, so chronic bronchitis that is brought about by irritated airway and your chronic bronchitis is characterized by excess sputum. So if the sputum is mucoid, it is considered to be a mild disorder, whereas if it is going towards purulent, meaning there is already presence of infection, it is considered to be a severe lung disorder. Okay, this one is an example of your frothy sputum. Okay, excessive pink frothy sputum is a sign of your pulmonary edema. It is characteristic for our pulmonary edema. So the x-ray on your left shows consolidation of the fluids, okay, which is your pulmonary edema. Hence, the patient might have pink frothy sputum. Then for pneumococcal pneumonia, it's usually rust-colored. For lung abscess, when I say abscess, meaning there is already deposit of pus in the lung cavity, okay, the tendency is for the sputum to become foul-smelling. Whereas if the patient has chronic bronchitis or lung cancer, you would suspect hemoptysis. So when I say hemoptysis, there is presence of blood in the sputum. Whereas if the patient would have tuberculosis, pulmonary infarction, bronchial adenoma, or lung abscess, that would lead to grossly bloody sputum. Okay, so again, tuberculosis, it is grossly bloody sputum. Adenoma is an abnormal growth in the lungs. Now, chest pain. Not all chest pain are cardiac in origin. Okay, it could be epigastric. It could also be in our lung cavity. So, for the chest pain brought about by problems in our lungs, it is usually described as continuous or made worse by coughing, deep breathing, or swallowing. So, this is what you refer to as your pleuritic chest pain. This is characterized by sudden and intense, sharp stabbing or burning pain in the chest when the patient is inhaling and exhaling. So particularly, the pain is very prominent whenever the patient is inhaling or whenever the patient's lung is expanding. So you have BOB or dyspnea. So when I say difficulty of breathing or dyspnea, take note that this is a subjective perception. 
oftentimes the error is we document dysnea as an objective finding. Take note that dysnea is considered to be a subjective finding or subjective perception. So whenever our patient is having dysnea, further assessment would be onset. We need to know if the onset was slow or abrupt. Was it a sudden change from normal breathing to dyspnea or was it slow? Next duration, how many hours has it been or how many days has it been? Okay, if it is an acute onset, we will be more alarmed about it. Next, relieving factors. We need to ask if the change in position would relieve it. Are there drugs that he used to relieve it or the activity cessation can relieve it? Okay, if the activity cessation could relieve your dyspnea, meaning this is dyspnea on exertion, meaning this is dyspnea that occurs whenever the patient is exerting additional effort. Okay, how about if the patient's dyspnea could be relieved by drug use? You need to determine what specific drug would relieve his dyspnea. For example, if the patient will say that the dyspnea can be relieved by salbutamol, you might suspect that the patient is having asthma. Or if the patient will say that the dyspnea could be resolved by puff, you might suspect that the patient will have asthma or is having asthma. You also assess the breath sounds. So you check for wheezing, crackles, or stridor, which occurs with breathlessness. So when the patient says dyspnea, you need to gather this information for you to supplement it with objective information. Now you have the term paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or PND. In your PND, this is a type of dyspnea which is intermittent during sleep that can awaken the patient. Okay, it is the difficulty of breathing that can make the patient wake up at night, okay, during sleep time. When I say orthopnea, orthopnea is shortness of breathing that occurs when the patient is lying down. It is relieved if the patient is sitting up. So this is usually caused by excessive deposits of fluid okay, in the lung basis. So if the patient is lying down, the tendency of the fluid is to be spread throughout the lungs. However, if the patient is already sitting up, the fluids will be staying at the basis, allowing the upper parts of the lungs to expand. Okay? Your dyspnea could also be caused by your chronic lung disease. And it could also be caused by your left-sided heart failure. Just remember that if there is left-sided heart failure, the blood from the left ventricle would backflow towards the left atrium. And the blood from the left atrium would backflow to the pulmonary vein. And then from the pulmonary vein, it would backflow towards your lungs. Hence, leading to lung-related manifestations or pulmonary-related manifestations. We also assess for the presence of wheezing. So wheezing is identified or defined as high-pitched musical sound. So if wheezing is present during inspiration, asthma is suspected. Whereas if wheezing is present during expiration, bronchitis is suspected. So your wheezing is caused by the bronchoconstriction or the narrowing of your airways. Ronkai, which is defined as low pitch continuous sounds heard over the lungs, may also indicate partial airway obstruction. So whenever we hear wheezing and ronkai, the next thing we will be ruling out is airway obstruction. Thank you for your kind attention. You may take a short break before proceeding to the next video.